Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of three big talks in integrative omics. This is a series of three seminars that we are organizing in integrative omics and systems biology uh, topics. Today, we will hear from Dr. Pedro Beltran, who is a group leader at EMBL ABI, where he studies uh, how cellular functions have diverged during evolution, as well as how they are altered in disease. In his group, they employ systems biology techniques to analyze GOR study, post-translational modifications data from mass spectrometry experiments, among other omics, uh, to study the molecular sources of phenotype novelties, exploring how DNA changes are propagated through molecular structures and interaction networks to give rise to phenotypic, phenotypic variability. Dr. Beltrão has a PhD in biology from the University of Aveiro in Portugal, where during which he conducted his research at EMBL Heidelberg, and after which he conducted his postdoctoral research at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Beltran is a group leader at EMBL EBI since 2013 and will soon join ETH Zurich in uh, next year. Welcome, everyone. Hi, thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to share the slides. Um, so I think everybody can see this. So, as a, as a we just said uh, the title is um, a basic analysis of uh, GWAS studies. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief introduction to why we care about this and sort of some of the previous work that led into that. Uh, and then some discussion about the, the future perspectives of this. And just as a, a sort of a very open uh, introduction to this, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this short movie on the powers of 10 and relative size of things in the universe, but I, I saw this, if, if this is a very old short, uh, which I saw uh, a few years ago and it sort of inspired me to think about uh, uh, biology as well in terms of different scales. So it starts off by this you know, couple that's having a picnic and starts zooming out and each square is a power of 10. And I'm not gonna obviously go through the whole movie even though it's short, but it really sort of places the human dimension at the scale of the universe. So it zooms out to the outer universe and then it sort of zooms in back into inside the cell and, and sort of the atom, atom scale perspective. And uh, if you're sort of scientifically minded geek or something like that, it, it, it puts into context uh, uh, this idea that physics has that it should be possible to create unifying theories and that's something that physics is often trying to get at is, is rules that, uh, are descriptive and theory that's informative of different scales of all of the reality that we live in. And you know, this is also very beautiful in, in simplicity and idea that we one one way will be able to un understand and capture all these dimensions. And of course, biology lives only at a subset of these scales, but it still goes from atoms and sort of the motions of atoms and proteins to how different proteins work together inside the cell uh, to the organism and sort of behaviors of the organism and ecosystems, uh, which could be sort of, sort of scale of the globe if, if one might think of it in that way. And so one, one aspect of this is that from, from the biology perspective, we often study this in isolation across the scales. So if you're interested in developmental biology, you really often don't care about protein dynamics, you know, you, you won't be thinking about motions of atoms uh, if, you, if you're studying how does the heart develop. Uh, but of course, in biology, all these things are coupled. And it's interesting to think about even why we can study these in isolation. And I think one of the reasons why we can study these isolations is often the times, is often the, that the sort of variation at some of these levels gets buffered. And this is very true, for example, for, for mutations in proteins. In fact, more, many mutations in proteins don't do anything to the protein structure. And similarly, if you were to change uh, uh, something in parameters of, a, of, a, of, of signaling networks or metabolic networks, this may not have an impact on how the cell works and so on. So I've, I'm interested in uh, 
understanding in particular how genetic variation it propagates across these scales of, of biological organization. And so uh, the view that we take in the group is we one day would like to have a model that understands how variation that is introduced at the level of the DNA may or may not change biological objects, how these biological objects work together inside a cell to perform certain functions. And even if you change these parameters and these functions, how does this impact on sort of cell behaviors, organismal traits, and so on? And ultimately, this is you know what, what evolution cares about is fitness. And of course, for, for human biology disease, uh, is, is a product of, of all these scales of organization. And from the point of view of methodology, we ideally would like to be able to capture all these different things and do a different model. And I'm, of course, not going to be able to do this in my lifetime. And of course, I'm not expecting this to be solved in the next few decades even. So this is more of an ambition. It's a, and, and every project that we do sort of fits into some of these aspects. So these are the types of questions that we try to address. You know, how have different responses and functions evolved throughout evolution? How do they change across individuals of the same species? And how do they change a disease from genotype to phenotype? Within the group, we have two research lines that relate to this problem. One is this broad question relating genotype to phenotype. And the other is a subset of this, which is more focused at trying to understand this more particularly for kinase signaling systems or post relationship systems. And so for this presentation, I'm going to focus on this genotype to phenotype relationship uh, question. And, and so in particular for the field of human genetics, the major tool that has been employed over the last 15 years it's, uh, is a genome-wide association study, where I'm sure uh, every here is, everyone here is familiar with. As, as soon as we've have gotten the, the genome sequences and we have polymorphic positions, so positions that are variable across the human population, we can define SNPs that we can use to ask uh, if, they're, if they're variable across individuals and we can use these as anchors. We can divide people into cases and controls that may have a disease or a different change in a trait. And uh, we run a, a systematic association analysis between specific SNPs and, and that phenotype or that disease. And what that gives you is uh, regions in the DNA that are associated with, a, with the phenotype or the disease. Uh, and there's all sorts of difficulties in figuring out which is the actual SNP because of linguistic equilibrium. There's a region, it's a region of the genome, not a SNP, but there's a, a problem that I find the causal SNP. And then more interesting for me as sort of originally trained in biochemistry is, is what is the mechanism, the cell biology, and how does, how does these things change and they're related to phenotype. And so in this you know, big idea of being able to one day model variation from, from the genome to the phenotype, uh, some of the first things that we tried were with, with model systems, in particular Cerevisia and E. coli. I'll explain that a bit better. But what we wanted to do is, is let's say we have a, a model system, like e an E. coli cell. And we, supposedly, we understand now quite a lot about how an E. coli cell works. We have the E. coli sort of, uh, lab reference genome. And we could, we could potentially annotate this genome very well. So for example, for every protein coding region, uh, we could uh, imagine sort of getting protein structure information or alignments, and we can use this to make pretty accurate predictions of how a mutation would destabilize protein function. Uh, we also have transcriptional regulatory elements. You know, this is more for Cerevisia as an example, but then for these, we could also uh, come up with methods to predict uh, when a mutation is going to impact on a transcriptional binding site and therefore have a, an impact on transcription. We're far from being able to do this. Uh, but we've tried to put as much as we could into a, into a, into a computational framework, let's say, uh, that is also a website uh, that's called mutfunk, uh, mutfunk.com. You can go there and access this. But for E. coli, uh, the reference genomes of E. coli, uh, Cerevisia, and, and, and human, you can uh, upload your genetic variants of interest that you may have taken from, say, a patient, for example, or an individual. And we have different models that try to estimate when a mutation will have a specific impact on transcriptive binding sites, uh, protein interface, that is, uh, stability, or highly conserved regions. Um, and so based off of this, uh, we can make a, an estimated guess, of an estimation of sort of probability values associated with it, of how likely is it that any given mutation 
in say human uh, cerevisia or Nicolai will have an impact on protein function. And so, uh, based off of this, we 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 try this idea. So, can if I have if somebody gives me a genome from my E. coli, can I say how that E. coli is going to behave uh, relative to say the lab strain? And and in particular, can we say how how well will it grow under certain conditions? And I'll, I'll explain in detail how we try to do this, but. Again, given the genome, we can make all sorts of predictions of how the impact of, of different mutations. And what we needed is a set, a test set, or something to try to make the prediction on. So uh, we contacted many people that had different strains of E. coli, and we compiled uh, 700 uh, E. coli. Uh, we actually had more, but only 700 of these had a, a whole sequence genome available. Some of these we sequenced ourselves. And then we grew these different 700 different E. coli and 200 different stress conditions, so a series of chemicals, including antibiotics, uh, stress conditions, met metabolic uh, nutrient conditions, and so on. And uh, for 160 of these, and this is important, we also screen the, the gene knockout library for the lab strain. And so if you're not familiar with this, for E. coli, there is a, 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 a compilation of strains where each gene is knocked out in the reference lab strain of E. coli. And so for these, we can ask also if a particular knockout of a gene, uh, does that knockout confer resistance or sensitivity to certain growth conditions? So we do this for these 700 E. coli strains and for all the knockouts in the lab strain. And one first thing that we look at is if we simply correlate the phylogenetic distance. So how similar are the genomes with how similar are the phenotypic responses of that the, of those two pairs of strains. So each point here is a pair of strain. On the x-axis, we have the genomic similarity. On the y-axis, we have the, the phenotypic similarity. And so if we take out uh, uh, some group of strains that have to do with evolutionary experiments, so these are not natural isolates, so it's, it's slightly different. Uh, we do see a positive correlation, but you know, by no means does the genotype, just purely comparing the genomes, does that explain phenotypic differences? So, and this is intuitive because most of these genetic variations are neutral. They don't impact on proteins. So as I said, then uh, we can make predictions of how mutations would destabilize or affect the function of proteins. We can do this either with structures and this is before uh, alpha fold 2 So we had uh, good coverage, structural coverage for 50% of the residues. And we had good uh, sequence evolutionary con uh, uh, coverage for 95% of, of the residues. Uh, again, this is uh, all related to the E. coli reference lab strain. And so then uh, based on a set of known deleterious mutations, we can uh, simply parameterize the model that takes either the conservation information or the structural information and, and it gives us a p-value of how likely is it that a mutation is, is likely to be destabilizing. And these, you know, these predictions are, I'd say, fairly accurate. I know it's actually not so difficult to predict when a mutation is going to destabilize a protein. Of course, you know, one can argue about the, the details of that, but I think sort of grossly speaking, these are reasonably good predictions. So, uh, of course, you can have more than one mutation in a protein. So we need to combine them. Uh, we, we do a gross assumption that the mutations are independent. We have to, we, just because we can't really uh, come up with a better model that integrates uh, mutations that are not independent. And a very, very big uh, caveat in particular for E. coli is that we only look at the core genome. So the genome that's uh, that sort of conserved across the E. coli strains. And for E. coli, this is a gross uh, sort of caveat because each strain carries a set of genes that are not uh, common across multiple strains. So there's there's missing there's sort of genes that will be there that we're not uh, making use of. And in particular, there might be a case where you have a mutation that completely destroys a protein, but there might be another protein that's not a core genome protein that may be replacing that. So we, we cannot take that into account. Okay, so then how do we make these predictions? As I said, for the lab strain, we have these knockout collections. So we have, for each gene that's knocked out in the lab strain, we know if I take out this gene, uh, 
uh, the lab strain is going to grow very poorly if I do some particular shock. Like if I give them uh, a particular antibiotic, if it's missing this gene, uh, the cell dies basically. So the question was, if, if I now look at a genome and there's a, say a stop sign, an early stop sign in that protein, I should expect that that particular strain that does not have this gene because there's an early stop sign or some other highly deleterious mutation. So this strain should also not grow when I present the strain with this antibiotic. So that's the rationale. And this is how we come up with a score. So essentially we take all the genes that are important for that condition and they also come with the quantitative metric of how important they are in the lab strain. And then we have the probability that that gene is severely mutated in a given strain. And based off of these uh, values, we can say, how likely is it that this strain one is gonna grow under a particular set of conditions? So in this case, for condition one, uh, we're predicting that this strain one is not gonna grow well. And for this other condition two, we're predicting that strain three is not gonna grow very well. And then we compare these predictions with the actual experimental data. And we just see you know, how well does this prediction, which is not trained on the data. So we didn't train any of this on the growth data that we measure. So I'm gonna show you an example of where this works fairly okay-ish, but you know, the, the general outcome of this is that it, it is much better than random, but for many conditions, it doesn't predict very well. But I'm gonna show an example also to illustrate a potential mode of failure. So why is this not working? So, uh, and again, to give you, to just explain the figure here, each line here is one of these 700 strains. And then for this particular condition, psilomonic acid, uh, these are the genes in the lab strain that are important. So if you take any of these genes uh, and with different contributions, with different, with different impact, they will cause a slow growth or no growth under the presence of this condition. And then for each of these genes that are important for this condition, we're marking here when any of these strains carry a highly deleterious mutation uh, predicted from sequence or structure. So when we put this together, we have a prediction score that's shown here on this bar. Uh, so that the, the more red this is, the more we think the strain would be very sick in that condition. And then next to that is the experimental data. So the, the poor growth or no growth is highlighted here with, again, with a reddish color. And you can see that you know, at the top of this, uh, we enrich very strongly for things that grow poorly. Uh, but we also make mistakes, as you can see far down here. Of course, this is not perfect, but you know this is a particularly good example of where this worked pretty well. And then, based off of this, we could immediately see one mode of failure. So one thing that we were doing incorrectly, and and it's shown here. So this particular gene, RFAE, uh, is required in the lab strain for growth under pseudomonas acid. If you take that, you know the cell doesn't doesn't grow under pseudomonas acid. But if we see any time we're predicting to this to have a deleterious mutation, uh, uh, we would predict that the cells are not growing very happily under this condition. But in fact, uh, the cells don't have any problem with this condition. And so this leads to one of the questions that uh, was raised by this study is how conserved is gene function across individuals of the same species? So if I take out this gene in different individuals of the species, it, it may be simply be that is essential in the lab strain, but it's not essential in the other in the other strains. And so that, that relates to this issue of incomplete penetrance also for human disease, where you have a mutation that's supposed to be determining a very, very, very strongly a disease, but it's said to be not always penetrant. So depending on the genetic background, you may manifest or may not manifest that disease, and you may manifest it later in time, in age or, or earlier in age. Okay, so you know, from these earlier studies, and we've done the same with uh, 1,000 strains of cerevisiae, but you know, from these earlier studies in model organisms, this is what we've come up with. So we have these uh, computational models that can cover different variant effect predictions, and we will continue to improve on this. Um, we get you know, reasonable correlations between predicted and observed growth effects for 40% of the conditions. Um, they have a significant number of growth defects. You know, is this, you know, I think this is good, of course, much, much better than random, but that, that not unexpectedly, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. <clears throat> so then this led us to a question that I'm not gonna explain in detail, but what we did was we actually did just the, the experiment directly is we, we knocked out genes, the 
all genes in four different uh, genetic backgrounds of Cerevisia, so four different individuals of Cerevisia, and we measure growth under different conditions, which is simply asking the question, if I take out a gene that's supposed to be essential for the response to DNA damage, does the genetic background matter? And for 20 to 40 percent of the cases of, of significant gene to phenotype relationships, there was a change that depended on the growth, depending on genetic background, which is you know, much larger than I expected. And if that's the same for human individuals across human populations, you know, that's that's you know strongly going to impact how how human genetics translates across human populations. <clears throat> They're not unexpectedly, you know, the biggest differences are with the Cervizia lab strain, the, the strain that most people use in the lab. The same for E. coli. Uh, these lab strains are clearly sort of not the typical strain, uh, but they're really lab adapted strains. And so, as I said, uh, for a panel of about 1,000 yeast strains, we've done something similar. But now we also have, for all these 1,000 strains, we have RNA levels and protein abundance levels that helps us to at least say how much this gene expression and protein abundance level information that we're not capturing yet in these models, how much this does help then explain variation in traits. And, and I didn't explicitly say this, but you know all of what I was talking about until here have to do with rare variants. So mutations are not very common across the, the, these populations of strains. And they're likely to be more deleterious than a common variation that's more likely to perturb gene expression states. So then, you know, going forward, what we'd like is to have a, a framework where we can jointly analyze common and rare variation, uh, in particular, so rare, rare, rare variation that's linked to phenotype via JWAS. And then going forward, I think there's going to be a lot of rare variation studies as well, so full exome sequencing data for population size cohorts where, where it's gonna be important to be able to combine both types of data. So this study is now uh, focused on the common variation, but I think you know, is, is a way to use the same approaches to jointly analyze common and rare variation. And, and the approach, so the framework that we're using has been used in the past by many different people, which is um, if we have a SNPs that are associated with a phenotype by JWAS, the you know one common way is to try to guess which is the the gene that's uh, associated with that SNP um, link sort of by linkage. There are different models of doing that. Uh, one can take simply the most the, the the closest gene to the SNP as being the causal gene. There are more complicated models. Um, we're using in this case we use a framework developed by Open Targets, uh, which is a machine learning based model that predicts for each associated SNP the most likely gene that's causative for that trait. So then we place those, those associated genes on a physical interaction network or functional interaction network, and uh, we diffuse the signal. So we simply try to find uh, other genes that are strongly interacting with these JWAS linked genes and say that those genes are also then likely to participate in the same disease or play a role in the same model. And if you're, you know, study cell biology, that makes absolute sense uh, because, you know, proteins that interact together are very likely to be taking part in the same process. If you're a human geneticist or sort of geneticist that studies uh, JWAS, you will be looking at this and say, yes, but then we don't have a causal support. We don't, we don't have a genetic SNP saying that, that by association with the SNP that we say that this gene is causally linked to that disease. And that's the, an important trade-off that I think uh, has to be considered. This is not new. This has been done by different people uh, uh, throughout, uh, say, more than 20, say, 10 to 20, 20 years close now. And uh, some of the things that are a bit different now are as we have a lot more JWAS. So there's many more traits that we can study like this. The protein interaction networks that we currently have are, you know, much, much better than they were 10 years ago. So I think there is a substantial difference in, in looking back at these approaches now. And there have been uh, sort of papers uh, showing that, in fact, the most critical thing in this whole procedure is having a very comprehensive interaction network. So then uh, we take these uh, genes, we map them to networks, we propagate them, and then we cluster. So we just find uh, groups of genes that are strongly interacting with each other. They have a high signal, so having genes that interact with these JWAS-linked genes. Uh, and they, they, we just 
to make sure that they they still have some genetic causal support, we, we try to make sure that they have at least two JWAS linkings in them. <clears throat> uh, so how do we know if this is working? So we need to benchmark this in some way. So what we've done is we take genes that are associated with diseases by text mining, and we exclude those that are uh, have JWAS that are linked by a JWAS that from our from our starting set of genes. So we're just not finding again the same JWAS linkings. Uh, we also take drug targets for the same diseases. So, and we again exclude anyone any such gene that's also linked to that disease by JWAS. And so uh, here's the the benchmarks of that. So these are just different thresholds of selecting disease-related genes. Uh, these are more towards the bottom. These would be more confident. These are drug targets for those same diseases. And what I'm plotting here is, is the enrichment over rent. So the AU and error in the rock curve, uh, 0 0.5 would be a random predictor. Uh, we also have two ways of doing the SNP to gene mapping. So one is, this, is by proximity, the closest gene to the associated SNP. And the other one is the genetics portal uh, machine learning based method that uh, associates SNPs to genes by things such as adding in EQTL information by colocalization and so on. And uh, generically, we see that we have uh, reasonably good performance, in particular for these more stringently defined disease associated genes, also for the non drug targets. And then uh, we see a modest improvement. Uh, sometimes we consider this to be significant, but it's, it's definitely a modest improvement when we use this more sophisticated SNP to gene mapping. And this is consistent with other people have found that, in fact, if you just take the closest gene to the SNP, that often gives you the most likely causal gene. And again, there's an important uh, thing to consider, particularly if you come from human genetics, these genes that interact with your JWAS link genes no longer have a genetic causal uh, association to that disease. Nevertheless, you know, there's no reason not to think that these could modulate the traits, but simply that there's no genetic variation that perturbs them in the human population. So therefore you could never discover them using JWAS. And more importantly, of course, I think this gives you the mechanisms of what is the cell biology. So these modules then represent concrete cell biology that is associated with that trait. So then we could do this, we can use this for many different things. So one thing that we could uh, immediately do that I thought it was quite interesting uh, for, from, from my perspective was we could compare all traits against each other by the network propagation score. So instead of saying, I have two traits, and do they share many JWAS linked genes? Uh, I can first run the propagation in the network and then ask across all of the proteins that now have a score, I can compare those vectors of scores across all possible traits. And this gives me a similarity matrix saying which human traits and diseases are more closely related to each other. And it's important that you know this allows you to do that even when there's G zero overlap, obviously, between JWAS linked genes across traits, but they could still be related uh, if, if those JWAS linked genes end up hitting on the same pathways and the same complexes. So when we do this, uh, we find many things that makes a lot of sense. And we also try to systematically benchmark this, not just, not just seeing if it makes sense, but whether it recovers uh, pairs of traits that are supposed to be functionally related. But, but you can just simply look at, at these relationships and, and you can see that a lot of these things make sense, such as, for example, uh, you have melanoma, sun, sunburn, freckles, and things related with skin cancer, having uh, net propagation scores across the proteins that are highly related. Um, and as I said, for each of these, we then also get these modules. So then what we can do is we can find, uh, so on this axis, we have each, each square here is one of these gene modules. And on the, on the tree, we have a set of traits that shares a, at least two, two of these gene modules. And so basically, uh, then in yellowest colors, we have uh, gene modules that are enriched for this subset of, of traits in this, in this cut of the tree. Uh, but basically what we can do say is that we have these all these set of traits, and I'm gonna show you examples, uh, for example, autoimmune related, sorry, Im immune related traits. And then we have for each of these will be a particular aspect of cell biology that is shared across these traits. Okay, so then, so from the broader perspective, we found 2000 associations between a gene module and a trait. Uh, 
a, about half of these were unique to a single trait. And then the rest collapsed down to 72 gene modules that are shared with more than one trait. <clears throat> if you look at the top, so these are the six most shared modules. So for example, regulation of transcription and proteasome uh, uh, activity is, is shared between 100 modules. And I should, of course, also first say, how do we come up with these names? Um, because I guess one of the difficulty in using these methods is, is the output is a bag of genes. So a, a module here is a group of proteins that have interact with each other. Uh, and so how do we figure out what, what biology this represents? In this case, we just ran a gene set enrichment analysis just to figure out uh, what type of genes are, are significantly enriched in this protein interaction uh, module. And this is how we come up with sort of these names, but that's, that's not always straightforward. So sometimes you may have a group of proteins that all functionally interact with each other, or physically interact with each other, but we don't necessarily know, uh, may not know what that represents. But, uh, you know, if you were interested in cell biology, you can clearly see that at the top of these things, uh, so the, the protein modules that are associated with most traits are things that are very broad uh, regulation processes, such as, you know, regulation of RNA, protein regulation, regulation of transcription and proteasome, or things that regulate with sort of membrane trafficking and signaling. And so uh, what I think this allows us to say is, is also what are the protein biological processes that are most pleiotropic. And pleiotropy here means if I perturb this, it will have a very broad impact on many different traits. And again, this is intuitive from point of cell biology. If I mess up general transcription or if I mess up protein quality control, of course, I'm going to have a very broad impact on many different biological processes. While if I sort of mess up a very sort of particular aspect of cell biology, then you know, that biological aspect will, will only impact on a certain number of traits. So this gives us then uh, what I think is a, is a global view of human cell biology pleiotropy. So how, how different aspects of cell biology impact on, on are either very narrow or very broadly across different traits. And then from the point of view of drug discovery, which is sort of part of the interest of this, there is sort of pros and cons. So the, the pro here would be that if you take uh, gene modules that are associated with many different traits, then maybe you can repurpose drugs. So that means if I, if I impair or if I, if I impact on a specific aspect of cell biology, I'm gonna potentially impact on all these different diseases simultaneously, which may be good. And then the negative side of this is, of course, that this also implies potentially many negative side effects of the drugs. So if you, if you impact on, on very pleiotropic cell biology, uh, then this may have many negative side effects. And we tried to search for this, but uh, I think we, we need to do a better job of this. Um, so we do find that across these 72 gene modules that are impacting more than one trait, we find a significant enrichment for genetic interactions, so genes that have many genetic interactions compared to the other ones. Um, and we have a, a very small, uh, significant, but very small enrichment for drug targets with listed side effects. And I think we, we have to improve on this analysis. I think there are things that we, we haven't tried yet. <clears throat> okay, so, but then if we then, we can zoom in and, and look at some of the examples. So this is a network module that is linked to six traits or, or diseases, uh, which are listed here, they are all related to bone. Uh, so some of these have to do with bone mineral density, and some of these have to do with, with bone diseases. The JWAS associated genes are marked here uh, with colored borders, and the the darker the color, the the more of these traits they have in common. But you have cases like our LRP5 that is within this module, but is only associated with one of these traits. So then when we take these modules, we, we can uh, also look at um, mouse phenotypes. And in this case, for example, we find many genes that in, that in, in sorry, the, what I meant is clinical variants. So if you look at uh, variants that are known to be pathogenic in patients that have specific diseases. So in this case, this gene module is enriched for clinical variants uh, that are related to bone related diseases. And an interesting, observation was that in this case and a few other cases that we tried, there was little overlap between uh, the genes that are found via JWAS and those that are found by these clinical variant studies that are often found by either family studies 
or in, or individual studies of uh, exome sequencing. So therefore, these these tend to be more protein coding variants with higher effect sizes. But they, but but I guess the point is that the both of these enrichments are pointing to the same cell biology, with, which relates to wind signaling, but through different proteins. And that's this is why I think this is going to be a promising approach to combine rare and common variation, because we can use the common variants to find the modules and then uh, use this to find sort of rare variants that will have an impact on the, on the module itself. Uh, so here we also have a drug target uh, source of, of one drug that's used uh, for, for bone related disease, uh, which has a very strong genetic evidence from these rare variant studies, but not from the common variation studies. <clears throat> um, and again, just a, another example of something similar where we have in this case, a, a few of these uh, immune-related traits, such as allergy, asthma, uh, and eczema, and things like this. And some of these, but not all of these, are associated with, with gene modules that are enriched for JAK-STAT signaling, uh, pattern recognition. And, and again, so one, 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 I think, interesting thing here is, again, that although uh, for example, allergy is not enriched for this pattern recognition uh, receptor module. Uh, we can use the fact that allergy and allergenic rhinitis, rhinitis is, are so similar in our network propagation score that we may be able to use this then to infer also an association. Uh, but here again, we have these uh, JWAS link genes with bar colored borders. And uh, again, oftentimes we have things that have, have been found in only one of these traits but together they are enriched in, a, in the same biological processes that relate to jack stack signaling. And if we look at uh, uh, mouse phenotypes, or which are here in blue, or in patient uh, disease um, clinical variants, we again can find uh, cases of significant enrichment, statistically significant enrichment, uh, but via different proteins that are not JWAS link genes. Okay, and just, just uh, to, uh, towards the end now, uh, we also been looking more focused, more specifically at, at neurodegenerative diseases. So there was one case uh, that was published where we collaborated on a study of fine mapping uh, of Alzheimer uh, disease associated genes. And that was simply more, we can use the network score as another feature to decide which of the genes in a loci are more likely to be the actual causal genes by, by functional interactions. And another example that I'm going to show you about is, is how we can take advantage of the same network-based approach to combine JWAS information with gene expression data. And so uh, in this study, Anders Lakatos from Cambridge, they have derived astrocytes from, from cells, from uh, 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 epithelial cells derived from SOL1 mutant patients. So these are people that carry SOL1 mutations that are uh, causative for ALS. And what he wanted to figure out is what is the solid one mutation doing to the biology of astrocytes? So he differentiated astrocytes from, from cells from these patients. And I'm going to skip this. Uh, what he did was he, they collected gene expression data and protein abundance data changes for these solid one mutant astrocytes compared to quote unquote wild type astrocytes. So here on the top, I'm just showing you the numbers of differentially expressed uh, proteins and genes in, in red. And what we can do is we can, again, run uh, this permutation-based method. Instead of, instead of taking the JWAS genes, we can take the differentially abundant proteins or the differentially expressed genes, and we can place them on the same network, and we can run the permutation again. So we run three independent uh, propagations, one for gene expression, one for protein abundance, and one for JWAS genes. And we can then look at the overlap of the modules. So modules that are found by these three different uh, data sets. And so not surprisingly, when we do this, uh, we, we can find a higher number of genes in common than when we just look at uh, a, a individual protein changes or, or gene expression changes. So then uh, we've picked two uh, gene modules that are, uh, that are having common changes in gene expression, changes in protein abundance, and also are enriched for JWAS-related uh, genes. Uh, 
and they have to do with uh, Golgi vesicle transport and, and a targeting to the ER, basically. So both of these two things are sort of protein targeting related or trafficking related. And so out of these, uh, uh, Anders Lakatos lab picked uh, one particular protein. And I'm, I'm just gonna show you more of the actual data. So here we have uh, gene expression changes in the, in the astrocyte mutants and, and protein abundance changes compared to the astrocyte mutants against the wild type. Each point here is a protein slash a gene. So here you have cases where you have down regulation at both at the RNA level and at the protein level. And then uh, we picked all the cases where you had a down regulation or up regulation, and they were part of these modules of interest that had uh, shared uh, information. And from this, uh, Anders just picked uh, K5A as a potentially interesting candidate for, for having an impact on astrocyte biology. So does, does the down regulation of K5A in a sod one mutant background uh, have an impact on the astrocyte biology. And uh, so this is their data and I'm not gonna sort of explain this in, in very depth, but essentially uh, what happens, I'm showing you here where they've looked at astrocytes either from sub one mutants where they have down regulation of K5A uh, or non-mutants where you have tubulin, K5A staining and mitochondrial staining. And you can, can see is that in this uh, sovereign mutants where you have down regulation of K5A, you have particularly a loss of K5A at the protrusions of the cells. And, and equally at these protrusions, we have a, a decreased uh, uh, migration of, mit of mitochondria. And they've done further experiments to show that causally it is K5A that's doing this effect, is not something else. So if you down regulate K5A, uh, you have the same impairment of trafficking of, of mitochondria. Okay, so that, that's where we're currently at with this type of projects. You know, it's, um, one, one thing that really comes out of, of these projects and trying to do this, and it's a question that comes off uh, very commonly, is it, are these interaction networks specific to a different cell type? You know, if I have a disease of the brain, does it make sense to use these particular network or do I need a different network? And so that gets at the question, uh, can we say what's the interaction network of a neuron versus an interaction network of a hepatocyte, let's say, if we wanted to do that. And, and experimentally, uh, this is still not feasible yet. I think we're probably close to being able to do this. So it's experimentally still very challenging to systematically identify the protein interaction network or the regulatory networks of a neuron uh, in, in a few experiments with a few labs. I think this is still completely impossible, I'd say. So what we do have is a lot of data that comes from HACK and HeLa cells and all these different things all put together in a database. And this is what we're using. So, so if we cannot do this experimentally, then is there any ex computational way? Is there any computational approach by which you can take this mishmash of, of cell biological information and, and tell you what is the network and the biology of a neuron versus a hepatocyte? And if you can do that, can we then say, how is a mutation going to have a differential impact? Why is some mutations manifest as a disease of the liver and other mutations manifest as a disease of a neuron? That's it. Okay, and with that, I'll, I'll stop here. Acknowledge lab members, uh, recent funding, and um, you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Pedro. This was uh, really interesting. Uh, we will now have time for a few questions from the audience. Okay, uh, Rafsan, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, hi, Pedro. Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I just have two questions regarding your research. Uh, you talked about 72 different uh, gene modules. Uh, I was just wondering that what sets the size of these modules? So how do you, what is the cutoff and how do you define that? And uh, my second question would be that uh, you talked about network propagation. And uh, in that case, do you consider the significance of the neighbors in the network? Thank you. Yeah, size, size of the module. So I think uh, essentially we, we cut down any module that's bigger than 300. And I guess I don't have a very good justification why, we, why that number and not other number. But essentially we, we iterate. So if it's bigger than 300, we try again to cut it down. And, and I don't have very good uh, justification why that number. I, I didn't fully understand your second question. So what we get out of it at the end is 
we get a score for each protein in the network, right, from the propagation. Uh, and so we cluster and define modules. But what was your question again? Yeah, I was just wondering that do you also consider the neighbors of each gene in that case while you're scoring for the modules? Have you considered that? I, so like things outside of the module? No, I mean, while, while you're trying to get the module, uh, are you considering for each gene, are you considering their neighbors as well and their weights, each consecutive weights? Uh, no, so I think we take the weights of the genes, but the clustering is independent of the weights, I think. So we just cluster the network and, and then we look for, we use the weights to look for modules that have a sort of more weight than you expect by chance. All right, thank you. More questions? I, I have one uh, while uh, people think I have one. So um, I'm wondering if uh, you have employed these techniques uh, to think more about uh, drug repositioning opportunities. You, you've mentioned something about uh, tissue specificity, but I'm wondering if you would like to comment more on, uh, on this, if you have examined it or, or not. Uh, from the point of view of drug, drug repurposing, you mean? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah so we didn't, we didn't fully explore it. I guess the only way that we did that is, is simply by saying in this, uh, the benchmark, right? In a sense, the interaction partners of JWAS link genes are enriched for drug targets of the actual disease, even though they're not JWAS link genes. So therefore other such interaction partners will just have a higher odds ratio. So they, they should also be more successful drug targets. If there's already a drug that targets those same genes, but is applied to some other disease, then it makes sense to potentially try it. And, and for some of these gene modules, we did look in the details and we found some examples where, where the repurposing had already been done. So there were already sort of initial clinical trials repurposing that drug or there was some sort of at least some uh, fundamental basic research suggesting that the repurposing made sense. Uh, but we didn't systematically do that uh, very much, I'd say. <clears throat> and I, you know, I should say, this was a very interesting study for us because we were doing this together with human geneticists, also some people from pharma companies. And it's very interesting that everybody had a very different sort of perspective on it. It's a very different uh, view of this same problem. Uh, and it was very interesting. I think it's a, there's a lot of space for this interaction between cell biology, structural biology, human genetics, uh, chemistry. Other questions? Go ahead, Johan. I, yeah, sorry, I didn't find the button to raise my hand virtually. Anyway, uh, so you talked in the beginning about your predictions for protein structures and how they uh, can impact uh, uh, a change in fitness or a change in protein function. So the, the second part of your talk uh, with the interaction networks, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, do you use your protein predictions in that at all? And do you have plans to do that? Or? Uh, yes, no and yes. So no is we don't. So that so the second part of the talk was all about common variation. And most of those common variations are, are <clears throat> SNPs that are associated in non-coding regions. So then it's not a protein mutation. Uh, however, these recent studies using exome sequencing data sets so for example, the UK Biobank now has, I think 300,000 so exomes. I don't know what the number is. And now these associations are of course, you know, exomes. So therefore they're all protein coding regions. And there, there's a lot of benefit on, on using these structure-based methods to make predictions of the impact of mutations. In particular, because, you know, oftentimes in particular, if you don't think about protein sequence and protein structure, you just say mutation in the protein is a mutation. So is I, I sort of, sort of deleterious mutation in a protein and they don't care what the residue is or stuff like that. But <clears throat> in fact, there's a lot of benefit to knowing, are you destroying a particular activity of the protein? Because then 
uh, for drug purposes, uh, if you find an association, then that's that's very informative, and that's where structures makes make sense. And if everybody's been following you know, alpha fold uh, two, now also makes a big difference in this. And so we we've already benchmark alpha fold two models for this purpose, and they're good or better than on, on average they're good or better than experimental models for this problem of variant effect prediction. Any questions, please? Go ahead. I might as well continue. Uh, so it's, uh, it was kind of a side note on your talk, but uh, you were talking about how you have uh, transcription and translation data for the 1000 yeast strains. So that's, I think that's very interesting. Do you um, like, What's your grand scheme of, of what you're gonna do with that? Uh, yes, yeah, you say that's not our data, therefore I didn't go into the detail. Okay. So uh, what we simply did with that is, is uh, in, in simple ways, does that help us better predict phenotypes on top of the mutations? <clears throat> and as expected, it does obviously. So um, there's some amount of, of variation in the traits that is explainable by mutations in proteins that sort of destroy protein function. And then quite a bit of that is also sort of further explained by gene expression variation or slash protein abundance variation. And in fact, you can combine them uh, together uh, to help explain trait variation. But it, you know, because the sample size is still small, so it's only a thousand is not that much actually. Yeah. But so that it's very hard to, to come up with sort of mechanistic models. Cool. Do you do you have you look for did you, do you see any buffering if you have a really uh, big effect mutant of a protein? Do you see any buffering in the translation or the transcription? Uh, yeah, again, not going to come specifically on that from this particular <laughs> data set, but we've done the same on a data set from cancer set data sets. Uh, and, and yeah, there's really a lot of buffering on many different levels. And it's, uh, so we, we've looked at a specific mechanism of buffering is due to protein interactions. <clears throat> so oftentimes you can have a down regulation of gene expression, the RNA level, but the protein level is buffered by interactions. So that, and that has to do with degradation of the protein. So it, it probably complicated to explain shortly. Yeah. But the, you know, there's, there's a thousand publicly available data sets for, for tumors where you have matched DNA, uh, RNA, protein and phosphorylation. So that's quite a lot that you can sort of play around with that. Oh, thank you. In the first part of your talk, uh, you've uh, briefly mentioned that you are now planning to uh, move those uh, genotype to phenotype studies uh, to human cells. I'm wondering if you would like to disclose anything about that, what you are thinking about that. Yeah, so I, I think you know the, the biggest problem that we're thinking about is really the cell type specificity, uh, and in, in some extent, it's common and rare variant uh, joint analysis. But I think that's less of a. I think the biggest challenge that we think have we have now is how do we come up with the biology of a neuron? Um, yeah, so and, and concretely, can we figure out what's the interaction network of a neuron? And there are published papers uh, on that. Uh, uh, but I think the reality is that. You don't, you don't even have benchmark sets. It's not like we have like an extensive protein pull down data set for neurons versus other types of cells. So it's, it's very hard for us to say, even if we're going in the right direction. But you know, just, just even that. So can we say how is the metabolic network, the signaling network, the protein interaction network of a neuron versus an hepatocyte or something? And so we, I think we have, we have some, some methods that we're trying to do work on that. Then. Any other questions from the audience? But you know, if somebody's interested in this in this direction of research, I think the the I think the key thing now is really these exome sequences that are coming in uh, population cohort sizes, <clears throat> and, and I, I feel like the next five years of human genetics are going to be much more protein centric because of this than they were before, which also means you know higher effect sizes and 
hopefully more actual people trying to do something with the associations instead of just having a nice nature genetics paper with a list of the regions in the genome right. that are linked to something. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if there are no additional questions, I, I would really like to thank you uh, for, for this wonderful talk. Uh, and I would like to tell everyone watching that the next uh, big talk will take place on Friday at 1 p.m. Central European time. So hope you can join us again. Thank you very much, Pedro. All right. Thank you.